afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are and whenever you are. I know that some people will come back and watch this later. Um, my name is Phil Seamark. I'm a Power BI MVP. I work quite heavily with Power BI. Um, really, really enjoy working with Power BI and, and, and actually have developed a little bit of a hobby of, uh, of late. Uh, building small, simple games in Power BI, mostly DAX, to try and explore and understand um, uh, more of what we can do in DAX. Um, we have 130 functions, and uh, yeah, we can do some pretty cool stuff, which I'm going to hopefully share with you today. Now, if you would like to follow along with this, um, I have my run sheet, my notes, um, available for download at dax.tips games. If you, if you type that into your browser, Go to dax.tips slash games. I'll do that here, dax.tips slash games. <clears throat> what you can do is just download a text file, which are my notes. But you can also, uh, there's a link to the detailed blog for each of the five games which I'm going to be talking about today. And you can download the PBIX file. I'm not going to be going through the DAX line by line because some of it is quite advanced. But what I'll do for each of the games is draw your attention or highlight what I think are the most interesting aspects so that you can kind of you know, focus on those bits there. Why games? Um, when I was young and, and learning about software development, I used to write my own games, simple ones, and I would pull apart other people's games. And I, find, I found that a really interesting way to learn the capabilities of the various languages that I might have been working on at the time. Um, and we know that DAX is quite a powerful language for analytics and, and, and reporting. And we know that it's very good at doing things like counting rows of tables or summing up a column, averaging a column, even some sophisticated things like perhaps a calculation that can uh, present a ratio of a, of a category compared with its parent. So all those those things we document and we understand pretty well. But what I thought I, what I thought I might do is explore DAX in a different, interesting, and unusual way to help get a better understanding for me what the boundaries are. And and I've surprised myself quite a bit. I, th I think the boundaries are much further uh, bigger than I originally um, uh, I originally thought, which is kind of cool. Um, now. We're going to be just dealing with Power BI DAX here. So the DAX that I'm, I'm going to be demonstrating is all Power BI DAX. We have a slightly different version of DAX in Excel. You don't necessarily have the ability to create calculated tables like we can in Power BI. Most of it should probably work, but this is very much a Power BI DAX based um, session. And what I've also tried to do with all these games is try and use the native objects of Power BI as much as possible. So while custom controls and custom visuals open up a, a wonderful array of graphics and, and I'm thinking things like the um, hopefully you've had a chance to play with the aquarium fish in Lighten, which is a pretty cool custom visual. Um, what I've tried to do with all of these games is use the out of the box slices, bookmarks and matrices, et cetera, visuals, etc. to develop all of these. And, and I'll highlight where I have used something that's um, a little bit uh, out of the the, the box. Um, I definitely want to have a big shout out to the guys at powerbi.tips because all of these games, um, one of the things that really bring them alive is the graphics and imagery and the, the imagery, image, imagery. <laughs> the guys over at powerbi.tips, particularly Mike Cairo, um, they've spent quite a bit of time in providing really cool backgrounds and, and graphics that bring these, the, these alive. And this is something that's definitely true of your business reports too. Um, it can make a huge difference if you develop a report and put some care and effort into a really nice background. And, and, I, and I urge you to go over to powerbi.tips and have a look at the really cool layouts that they provide, um, which are more than just backgrounds as well. They, they have the ability for you to auto place your data. Um, uh, yeah, go and check out powerbi.tips. There's a lot, a lot of fantastic um, information there. And also Margarita Prozil, who developed um, the Play Axis, which I use in one of my sessions, um, one of my games. I really want to thank her for some um, tweaks that she has made, uh, which hopefully we'll have, some, have time at the end of the session to, to show you. But first of all, one of the things that's really enabled the games to come alive is the introduction of bookmarks um, that was introduced probably about this time last year, I think. So when I jump to a blank Power BI report, I'm going to show you a really basic example of how you can 
uh, align bookmarks with buttons with slices to get the fine grain control that's needed for the um, for, for the games because they pretty much all use the same technique and then I overlay DAX over the top of the um, this these techniques for the um, uh, for the game logic. So what I have is a blank Power BI model and I'm going to create three tables. So on the modeling tab I'm going to say I want to create a new table and we'll call that just table one and we're going to use the generate series to create a single column table with values one through two. When we have a look at this table it just has three values, 0, 1 and 2. And this is going to be a flag that we want to control and set via bookmarks. Um, if I create another new table, table 2 equals table 1. And finally a third table, table 3 equals table 1. This just create this means my my second and third tables have exactly the same data structure as the first table. They're not going to be related. I'm not going to create relationships between these three tables. They're just going to be used to control uh, a flag state. And I'll refer to this later on. The next thing we want to do is put these onto the canvas and turn them into a slicer. And I'm going to make it a list slicer. So if we go like that for the second table and this one for the third table, I'm not going to lay these out too nicely for, for speed. I'm using the Format Painter to get them the same. So we have three tables. Now, I want to, now what I want to do is have three bookmarks that control these. So I'm going to unset this. Uh, I'm going to open my bookmarks view. Cool. And I'm going to set a state on my second slicer and add that as a bookmark. We'll call that bookmark2. But importantly here, what I'm going to do is say that this bookmark is only going to affect the current visual. It's not going to affect any, any of the other visuals on this page. And I'm going to um, update that. Now what I can do is set the third slicer, add a bookmark, call this one rename bookmark three, set that to be just the, the visual that I have selected. And then finally, we can come over here to bookmark one and independently I can rename that to be bookmark one, set that to be only for the selected visual which is that slicer. Okay and I'll unset these and a last bookmark is going to be my reset bookmark. So I've this is going to clear all my bookmarks and I do want this one to affect all um, all the visuals on the page. So this one I am going to leave as a an all visual bookmark. Cool. So finally what I can do is add three buttons. I'm going to place that one there, control copy, control paste, control copy, control paste. And the action on this first bookmark I'm going to set to call bookmark one. The action on this middle bookmark I'm going to call bookmark two and the action on this third bookmark I'm going to call bookmark three. Hopefully I've done that right. Um, so now what that means is if I click a bookmark it sets a flag. If I click another bookmark it sets a flag. If I reset, do this in the opposite order or any order you can see how the flags can be accumulated. Now this is important because these, the underlying slicer tables are what I will use in DAX to go and scan every time a change is made to get an understanding of what's happening in the, in the game. That's how I know what's going on. So that's, that's my setting up. Now some of the games have got 80 of these bookmarks, some of these only have 9, but I just want to show you that um, how I'm using bookmarks 
on top of slices on top of tables to keep track of um, what's going on. So let's have a look at the first game. So the first game I decided to um, have a crack at was uh, Blackjack. So I can open my Blackjack PBIX file. If you're following along at home, you can download the PBIX file and hopefully you'll get exactly the same one. So the idea of this particular game is it allows you to play one hand of blackjack. Um, a randomizer generates um, some cards for you. And if we reset this. Go back to here. OK. So the idea is you can't bet. You can only play one hand. A, a randomizer will come up with effectively shuffle the deck and, and, and have 10 cards, which you can draw up to 10 cards. Realistically, you're only going to want to draw maybe two, three, four, but you can hold at any particular point. When you hold, the house plays their cards. They will play until they draw 15. And if they get past 15, they'll hold or they'll keep going until they bust. It's sort of fairly standard um, blackjack, blackjack type uh, play. So we click on that bookmark to play, we can see that I have a four and I can either hold on four, which I'm not likely to do, or I can click hit. Now what's going to be happening here is I have a series of bookmarks sitting on top of each other. So when I click the first hit, the first bookmark is going to disappear and the second hit bookmark will actually appear behind it. What am I seeing here? 14. I'm going to hit one more time. Cool. 15. I'm going to hold on 15. So I'll click the whole bookmark, which will allow the house to play, and hey, we won. So underneath the covers, the logic for the game is kept here in player one. Now, I generate my random numbers up in power query, because if I, if I generate my random numbers in Power BI and DAX. Every time I make a DAX, every time I make a slicer selection, the random numbers are regenerated. So I need to have a stable platform that those random numbers are generated on. Um, so here's an example where I do something outside of DAX. So up in Power Query, I I generate um, some random numbers. So I have the player one can play up to ten turns. This is controlled in this column. The cards here, and these are the random numbers, are, are, are delivered here now the ace can be one uh, a two is two three is three etc um jack i think is 11 queen is 12 king is 14 and i think the the final ace can be 15. um so i use some decks to try and determine based on the accumulative run of cards what the best score might be so the highlight here is how to handle the fact that an ace can represent a score of one or a score of 11, and sometimes you want it's in your favor for it to be an 11, and, and other times it's in your favor to be one. So there's a little bit of DAX here that handles in certain scenarios, like this, this particular scenario, I think the last card was an ace. So it knows to use the value of one in this case rather than 11 to to allow us to have an, a, a score of 15. So um, so there's a little bit of DAX logic there in the score column to decide that if you hold up to 15, you're okay, but then any play after the fourth play, it will it will bust. And, and we'll see that. Um, I'll just, uh, I'll replay the same game with the same random numbers. So if we hit, 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 we bust. Um, the other thing I like about this particular game is that I'm using the unichar functions to generate the playing card graphics. These aren't SVGs, they aren't images, these are unichar values and I also use dynamic um, decks to control whether it's a, a red card or a black card so I, I can tell if it's a diamond to present it in a red fashion. This is just sitting in a, um, in a, in a, in a table visual. So we have a table visual for the player one and a table visual for the player too and that's it it's pretty simple this was my first experiment at a game and I quite enjoyed it um, I wasn't trying to do much more than this um, but yeah please download and uh, have a bit of a play now the the blackjack game if we have a look at the bookmarks and it results there are one two three four five six seven bookmarks 
in this particular game and there are about 12 visuals so it's not not too sophisticated and it didn't take me too long to put together <clears throat> so the next game is sudoku i'll just close this one down now this is not a sudoku solver this what i did was i, I went and found a whole bunch of sudoku games um, in fact kaggle had a a CSV file that you could grab that had a million games and the game was each game would be re represented by a string of 81 characters and um, I'll show you what that looks like hopefully my screen is catching up okay here we go if I zoom in here right so this is you're only seeing one line here because I filter it up in Power Query. I didn't want to download a million rows into Power BI Desktop because it just made the, um, uh, the, the PBIX file too long. So what we have here is um, uh, in the quizzes line, a zero represents a blank that the user has to guess. And over here in the solution, what we can show is that um, the, the actual value in the second top left square should be a two and then a seven, etc. So what I do is I take this, this string and using DAX, uh, move it out into a big playing board. So we have a matrix over here that shows you the, the clues. So we have an eight here in the top left hand corner. And what we're trying to do is guess the value that goes into the second square and the third square. So if I zoom in, because this is quite a high res screen, if I select a two, sort of marks this, and I think the next value is seven. It's quite a slow game because what I found is um, I had to use slices for each of these visuals and every time you add a slicer to your Power BI report it's embedding it in, in, into an iframe and there's a whole bunch of JavaScript overhead um, and slices are particularly heavy on the UI and the way they need to cross talk to each other and find out what's going on, what, it, what, what all the other slices are doing. But it's, this is telling me that yep, I've made a, I've correctly guessed the, the two in that particular cell. If I click on a seven over here it will um, refresh and let me know how I'm going. And what I do is I use DAX to track progress. And let's have a look at some of the highlights. So on the matrix, so here we go, on the gauge value there's a lot of string concatenation in this particular game where I just run through and check the value for each of these um, tables. So this game does not use the bookmark technique. We're, we're directly setting values on top of slices, but each slicer represents a, a, a cell position. So we have a slicer sitting in row one, column one. We have a slicer sitting in row one, column two, etc. And there's 81 slices. So there's quite a bit of DAX that manually walks through, like here, and checks 81 values, builds them up into a string, and then it can use that string to do a string compare with the, the solution and from the CSV file to help track how you're progressing. It can check each position character by character to get an understanding of how we're um, how well we're going in the game. It's telling us we've had two right guesses. If I, if I change one of these to an incorrect guess, what will probably happen is this will go back to 34. Um, my machine's not particularly fast. I, I do recommend you have a, a, a quite a powerful CPU based on your machine if you're going to play this on your desktop. Um, so that's the Sudoku game. So it's not, not particularly heavy on the DAX front. The next game um, I decided to, to work on was a uh, an interactive version of Tic-Tac-Toe, or Knots, Knots and Crosses. I'm not too sure which is the the the, um, the more familiar term for the game for wherever you tic, are. Tic-Tac-Toe is definitely the more familiar term for here in the States. <clears throat> Yeah, I wonder why I don't like noughts and crosses make sense. I don't. I, I I know it is both. Let's open that one up. 
So this is interactive and there were quite a few neat challenges to solve here. So the idea being is that you as a human can make a move and then Power BI will respond with a move and then whatever you then do, it will try and block you or trap you or, or, or make a line of three. And as you can see that the graphics make the game look fantastic. If I showed you a version of this game that doesn't have this fantastic background, and again, thanks to the, the guys at Power BI got tips, it makes a big difference. So, so let's play the game. As a, as a human, I can make a move here and I've placed my X and Dax has responded with an O. Now, I'm going to try and trap it by clicking in the top right hand corner and it knows to, to play here. If I, if I click down here, because if I don't click down here, it's going to win. All right, now I'm going to let the game, I'm going to let the computer win here by clicking in the bottom right hand corner. I don't know if my screen's catching up with us, but um, here is, we go. So that's the go. So how does this work? How does Dax actually do this? Now, I could have gone down the path of trying to write some AI smarts, um, but the option I went for was to pre-play the games. So I decided to have a data file with every single combination of games. So to do this, I assigned each cell a unique number. And I initially started with, this should be, the, the top row should be cell one, two, three. The middle row should be cell three, four, uh, four, five, six, et cetera, to eight, seven, eight, nine. But I quickly changed that to a binary um, method of keeping track of the pieces. So what I mean by that was I, um, the top left hand cell would be one, then it would be two, then it would be four. And in fact, I think I've got, yeah, here we go. Uh, no, this is the order. That's not the binary numbers, sorry. So one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. This allows me to have a number like 17, which when you pull apart in a binary or a bitwise fashion, knows that you've got a piece in cell number one and cell number 16. So you play two pieces and that's where they are. And the other thing I did was rather than go for the uh, left to right, top to bottom um, approach, I designed it so that it rotated so that um, it would go cell one, two, three, then four would be the right hand mid square. Now I'll explain why this will become quite apparent. It uh, does save us quite a lot of, lot of time. So the game, the moves just look like this. So here, what's happened is there are three numbers. The first number represents what the human has played. So I can tell from this top line that the human player has played a um, piece in cell one. The third number is the instruction to Power BI where to respond with the um, with the naught, the, the, the DAX piece. So what this is telling me is whenever the human player opens with the game in the top left hand corner, it will always respond with the um, with the center square because the center square is actually the binary two five six. Then the next um, uh, position is if the human has played um, if the com combined human pieces represent three. What this tells me is the human has played in squares one and two, because one and two equal three. So the human has played a piece in the top square, the top left square and the top center square. And 260 will actually be 256 plus four. So this is going to respond with a, um, a Power BI piece in the four square, which is the top right hand square. So let's test that theory. Let's just see if this is actually working properly. So you get the idea. So the human plays in one, the computer responds in 256. The human plays in, in two, and the computer responds in 256. So, so I effectively pre-play these games, and I'll, I'll explain that third number, that center number in a bit. Now, there's a lot of combinations, there's a lot of permutations if you think, what every square that the human can possibly start with, there are nine squares, and you have to respond with a, a number. Uh, the, uh, the, the DAX 
has to respond with a position and then the human could play in any one of seven of the remaining squares and you know it quickly extrapolates out to quite a large number of um, uh, games that I was going to have to pre-play but I'm lazy I, there was no way that I was going to work that out and I was going to make a lot of errors so what I realized was that the tic-tac-toe board has a lot of symmetry to it there are only realistically three positions that the human can possibly start in they can only start in a corner square they can start in an outside center square or they could start in a center square and if I pre-play games based on the human starting in any one of these three squares once I've pre-played them what I can then do is rotate them I can rotate the pre-played game pre-played games 90 degrees I can then rotate the pre pre-played games 180 degrees to 270 degrees so instantly it means that if I need 400 pre-played games I probably only actually have to come up with 100 lines in my data file but I can use DAX to rotate them and here's one of the neat things about using the binary maths for it in binary to rotate if I have my number as whatever this number here happens to be from the reverse of this is the 1, the 2, the 4, the 8, the 16. This is 16 plus 2. So to me, this represents an 18. And the, and the human has responded with these. Now, I can take a copy of this by treating this as a string, sucking out those two binary numbers and putting them at the start, like shifting them along to. That is the effect of spinning it around 90 degrees if I want to spin it 180 degrees then all I need to do is suck out these four uh, binary numbers and put them at the front and voila so um, and I could also I can also flip it horizontally and I do that in DAX so I suck in my CSV that I bring in is only based on games the human has started within these three squares and how the computer might respond and um, I have a binary mapping table to help me convert decimal maths to binary maths. So I have a number here that has uh, numbers 1 through 511, because that's the most numbers we can possibly have in the board. And I have the binary equivalent. And if you're interested, there are two versions of con converting binary uh, decimal to binary. One's a very basic, just concatenate up some, some bits and pieces. Um, or there's a, a more elegant uh, version that can handle as many bits as you want to convert, um, which is kind of cool. How many was that? Nine. I'll put that back because I'm not sure if I'm using that elsewhere. I don't want to break my game. So I can take the numeric number which is stored in the in the um, the data file and I can convert it to binary where I can do these. Um, chop off bits and take them from the end and put them at the beginning and and, and, and do some quite clever things to to ro rotate these round. I believe the moves pre-played games. Here's going to be some gnarly decks. Okay. When I, I'm just going to scroll through this relatively quickly. The pre-played games is where I do my bitwise mathematics to generate the <clears throat> the numbers so there's not a lot there but this is probably going to be the most interesting DAX to focus on if you want to download and have a bit of a play with this game and it's all around shifting those um, numbers and it's kind of cool so once I've got the um, pre-play games in memory and the in the model then I can just use DAX to to place the pieces on the board um, it's not perfect what I found was when I was playing the game especially when I got up to uh, move three or four for the human it would just jump it would um, give me a completely different set of pieces and that's because you can get an ambiguous scenario where Dax doesn't remember that the order that you've played the pieces let's say I play my first piece in the top left hand corner my second piece in the bottom right hand corner and then my third piece in another corner at that point it doesn't know the order that they were laid out and um, there are scenarios where while you played it in that order Dax maybe thought that you did the first two moves or first three moves in a different order and it jumps to a different solution so to partially solve this I didn't completely solve this uh, I use a I keep track of the last 
game that was last piece that was played to help reduce the um, the, the the conflicts. It gets it wrong about five percent of the time. So if I jump back to my data file, the center value here tells me to play this um, uh, computer response when the human pieces add up to three and the most recent of those three happens to be in the two square because further down there might be a, uh, a situation where the human has placed pieces on the add up to three but the most recent piece was actually on the one square and it might do something different um, so that helped reduce the level of ambiguity in the tic-tac-toe game um, but I, I think the um, the highlights for me was was really working um, uh, solving these challenges of, of not having to pre-play the games being able to do it in DAX uh, converting numbers to binary and back from binary um, um, Yeah, so if you download this particular game, make sure you get the moves.csv file and you, you probably need to update your Power Query to, to, to point to the moves.csv file wherever it's sitting. And you can you can delete, you can add stuff to it if you like. Um, I, 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 this, this did highlight to me um, a little bit about what is probably missing in DAX and that is the ability for calculations within calculations themselves to actually have a place to store a value some form of central um, session based value that it can go back and have a look at and if this was if I was writing this in more traditional type application um, languages like C sharp etc it would be far easier because you could just generate the um, uh, places for you to store variables and come back to and I would I would know exactly the order that um, things have been placed but there's no way, particularly after move three or four, that you can tell what order did the user play um, play piece one and two in. So, um, but otherwise, it's not too bad. And again, you know, the, the graphics make it look quite fantastic. So that was tic tac toe. Um, the oh, and it and it can't keep score. Like if you play this nine times, it doesn't know that you've won four games. The computer's won five games or anything like that. And I have deliberately built into the moves um, the uh, the doors for the for the human player to to win some games if you want to have a crack you, you should be able to win the game but don't be surprised if it jumps around hopefully i've explained that um uh, nicely the fourth game that i'm going to be sharing is um a hangman based game so before you move on can i ask you a question absolutely in, in looking at how you did that when you're playing with this did you play around the idea of maybe adding a url to a different gif so that way when they did a move here you could go out and go a boo or a well done you know sort of little animation for each move you give them some sort of you know a appraisal of of how did they do so like when you actually went out and gave them the game you could yes. have had a link because you know what play it was you could have had a link yes. to a gift that went out and said and give them a raspberry something like that. some sort of animation off to the side yeah um, it that, that could definitely be added yeah i didn't i didn't think of that um okay. right. i was just curious if you're playing with it and you're just like and the number of permutations going yeah that's too much work i'm going to continue on with my life all right, and I'll, and I'll show you how many uh, objects there are in this. So there were nine bookmarks and um, yeah, a bunch of images, buttons. There's, there's, there are hidden there are buttons over here that initiate the bookmarks. So there is a, when you click over here, you're actually clicking on an invisible button that initiates the bookmark that sets the slicer in the background that the DAX then picks up to understand what you've done. And then, then it goes and has a look up the, the, the gameplay to know what to respond with. So there's, um, there's a bit of logic there. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to agree with Frodo's 88. Uh, this one makes my brain hurt. Can't even imagine building it. So Frodo's, I, I totally agree with you. Anyway, oh, you wait. It gets better. <laughs> okay, we'll wait. It gets better. The next one's not too bad actually. The next one um, is a hangman-based game. But what I wanted to do here um, was not just pick random words. I wanted to use words that had a meaning to Power BI and DAX in particular. So I, I tapped into the DAX function library. There are approximately 130 functions in DAX. We know some, we know some X, we hopefully know calculate, for example, but there's a whole bunch that even I um, uh, don't use very often. So um, I, I use those as the words that the um, players are required to, to guess. So I'll get, rid of to, I'll get rid of this. And we called it Mission Impossible. Um, I think this might have been an idea that Mike Cairo had, because um, Hangman's a bit 
morbid, didn't want to have a, a gallow type theme. We wanted to make it a little more positive. So we thought you would have to guess the word while a Power BI logo was disappearing. And you had to guess, guess the word before the um, logo fully disappeared. So you could get about five wrong, um, five wrong questions. And this is um, firing up. All of these games are actually quite small, like um, uh, less than two megs in size, I think, for the PBIX files. Most of the um, sizes, the the fantastic backgrounds and images. So let's go. Let's jump to the intro page. Cool. So there's a bit of a, a you know fantastic background, and you can pick a slicer or you can run a slicer here that randomly selects a one of the 130 functions and you have to guess the word. Let's click on the start button. This is going to take us through. And here we go. So I can tell that this word has, I don't know, approximately 10 cells. Here's our Power BI logo that's fully formed. And we have five chances left. So I'm going to go ahead and guess an E. We have an E on the end. I'm going to guess a T. I've got no idea what this is. There's no T in here. Now notice the E has disappeared. Notice the T has disappeared. And we have lost a tooth in the Power BI logo. Um, I'm going to go one more guess, A. Eh? All right. And then if you get a bit stuck and you're worried about this um, exploding on you, I'll, I'll just one more. We can show a hint. Cool. And there's a URL that takes us to the um, page. You know, <laughs> the URL actually is a bit of a giveaway because the name of the function we're trying to guess is in the URA. So don't show the hint if, if you're really trying to, trying to genuinely guess this this game. So the makeup of the board, if we have a look at the bookmarks and the selections. So I have a bookmark for every single letter. Naming bookmarks is fantastic. Um, we also have slices for every single letter. So if we have a look at the relationship table, you'll see that there's a whole series of just disconnected slices one slicer for every single letter. And there's actually one for the, um, there's a full stop because there are some function names in DAX that are that have a full stop. Um, so there's a little bit of a trap there. Cool, so there's a few more bookmarks. Now the um, the main logic, there's not a, not a huge amount of DAX logic in here, is actually in the presentation or, or the, 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 the calculation that is behind this measure here. So if I click on this to go find the measure, it's under letter primer and it's in progress. And this is kind of cool. So what it does is it stores in a variable the word you're trying to guess. So at this particular point in time, this variable holds the the, the full word that you're trying to guess. And I think it's called lookup value from, from memory looking at the, the hint. Then what it does is it cycles through all 27 of the guesses that you might have made. So it just checks to see if you have guessed, uh, and we've guessed A, so it will um, create an A. It's actually going to create a, a, a horizontal string. At this point, the string has only got one character, and the character is A. We haven't guessed B, we haven't guessed C or D. We've guessed E. So then we'll, it'll concatenate that on. So at this point, our variable and guesses will have two characters, A and E. And then finally, when it gets down to T, it'll add that as well, because it knows that we've guessed that. So we've got a, a three character um, string here called A, E, T. And I think I've also guessed Z actually, so it's probably got four characters. That's cool. So then what I do is I take the actual word we're trying to guess, the lookup value, which might have 11 characters, I think. I'm doing some quick mental maths. And I pivot that round to be horizontal. So I use the, um, I create a table to have one row per letter. Then what I do is for each of those letters, because this is a single column table, I do a search on the guesses variable to see if I get a match. Remember this guesses variable has got A, D, T, and Z. And where there's a match, it put, puts a one into a, into a column. And then um, where there's no match, um, there's, there's a zero. And finally, I pivot this around. And where it has had a match, um, it'll 
actually put the letter in place where it hasn't had a match it'll put an underscore in so that's i'm not going to go i don't have time to sort of really go function by function but um i'm i'm using dax to pivot things horizontally to vertically then back to horizontally again um and it does it in a way that um if there are duplicate letters it handles it quite nicely so i think we've got some duplicate o's so if i guess o there we go it's, it's quite quite correctly displayed both o's and those there but this is just a string which is just underscore space um correctly guess letter space correctly guess letter because i'm using the space as the um, delimiter in the concatenate ex one of my favorite functions is actually concatenate ex i, I use it quite heavily I, I use it quite heavily in the binary um section that we covered um briefly before so that's the um hangman game Got that. yeah and the used used svg the technique of um drawing an svg onto an image so there are this this logo has um I've actually got five copies of this logo. Each logo is in a slightly different state, and that sits in a table, and I can use a dynamic uh, calculated measure as a filter to go and check how many wrong guesses have been made to decide what row of the table of um, uh, images to actually show there. I think um, SVG images sit in a table that looks like this so there you can see the F svg code i'm sure if you tune in for david eldersfield's fantastic webinar earlier this week you'll you'll um you'll know what i mean by there great fun so the last um one i want to show you is um one that i only completed this week now i haven't written up the blog for this i will be writing this up probably this weekend when i get a bit of time because it's going to be quite a lot of detail in this when each of my blogs does have a lot more detail that I'm, I'm, I'm skimming over today. But let's go have a look at that. Um, close this down. And Minesweeper. Half the fun of these um, games is actually trying to come up with what games to do next and going, is that possible? Mm, nah, that can't probably be done in DAX. So, no, nah, actually, maybe it can. So let's open this up. Now, the real challenge with Minesweeper is as you know you can step on a square and if the square has a mine you lose if the square doesn't have a mine it reveals the square and that square might be a number if you're near a mine and the number represents how many mines you might have in your close proximity but if it's a blank square what i have to do is reveal all of the squares in the region so i'll just let this wake up in a line i want to show you the um the, the, how this actually works first. So if I um, get rid of these three matrix C's, cool. So this is actually using a, a lot of column base maths. So if I jump to the game, game logic table, what I have in my game logic table is a series of coordinates, one through 81. I'll just order these because this is a nine by nine matrix, okay? So, and this is using a left to right, top to bottom um, uh, setup. So uh, across the top row, it's, it's values one through nine. I generate 10 um, numbers in Power Query that are going to be the mines. So I have a mine in the cell eight and 17, et cetera, 22. So that places the mines, that's nice and easy. And in fact, we can see that if we, um, take out this and we just drag mine into a matrix so we can see here the layout of the 10 mines so that's cool so that's i know that if you step on one of these squares you lose the game but what i need to do is perhaps for the squares in the immediate proximity show a number that represents the number of mines that there are you're close to so in the square i've got highlighted here i would want to show a two so again i do that in a calculated column uh, each each square has a um, an xy coordinate and what i do is in, in the numbers a numbers column is it applies some decks that creates some filters to count the number of rows and this is filtered right down to for every single square um, a, a table that only contains squares that are immediately above it below it to the left and right and diagonally opposite 
and um, uh, we can see that here this is actually counting the the, the periphery <laughs> I have a table called periphery which has the adjustments that you want to make when you're trying to understand what's near you and I use this quite a bit um, where is periphery there must be a, a, a table in here somewhere okay doesn't matter it just contains numbers um, minus 10 minus 11 minus 9 to look at the um, numbers above you plus 10 plus 11 plus 9 for below you and plus 1 minus 1 for for next to you and then it just does a count so if we have a look to see if that's working um, I have a measure that can um, show this so the X's are mines and the numbers are correctly showing the output of that filter base count so we know here it can we can see there's a count now the challenge I've got is I've got two regions of blank here now in the Minecraft game when you click on a blank they all have to reveal now how do you do that in DAX I like I puzzled about this for a while I I thought am I gonna have to have iterators nested and iterators iterated and ne iterated <laughs> nested in iterators but the complexity is these shapes are really irregular they could be they could come around on a corner among themselves and I came up with a solution I was quite happy with so what I did was I take out my measure I'm going to put in a base region so this column shows me the number that represents the square so long as it does not have a number or a mine so you'll see there's a whole bunch of blanks here so the the items in this column that have a value are my blank squares so you can see the shape of the region that's kind of cool but I need to understand when I click on the square I have to reveal these other squares but not the ones over here okay so I need to get something in common and I thought the way I could do that is to try and find what is the minimum number in this region and what is the minimum number in this region and push it out and I used a column a series of columns to determine that so in my game logic there's a horizontal one vertical one horizontal two vertical two there's there's three sets of passes so what the first pass does is it says for every single item that's in my row that's connected to my region because I can boundary these off um, these if these regions overlap they'll they'll still be self-contained just push this number out uh, the minimum number so if I take out my base region and put in horizontal one what's happened is the minimum number on this row has was one so they've all got the same number they've got 14 they've got 24 etc so you've got these horizontal bands of the same number now if I go and show the vertical so my next pass is to take what's the minimum number vertically so the ones are being pushed down so this region here is effectively complete but down here I've still got some 81s and some 65s and the 58s the 58s got pushed vertically horizontally first and now they're coming down so what I need to do is apply another horizontal um, uh, layering over that so if we go horizontal two, there we go so the 58s are coming out I need these to push around the corner so if we go vertical two, you'll see that the 58s are now coming down and then finally horizontal three there we go so each region every square in each region now has the same number now I can um, rank these so these can be um, all ranked number one and these can be all ranked number two so that I can present a region there we go so I now have a some DAX that allows me to understand when you click on a square here to reveal all these other squares here and that's that's kind of cool you can see that as you move across through the um, columns to determine what um, is going on and the final um, matrix should be step value if we throw step value into this uh, matrix you can hopefully see what's going on so that's the full underlying game logic that's there so now all I need to do is present a game board that allows people to click on here 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 and and determine what we what we do um, if I jump back to the board let's have a look at um, how many bookmarks and items we've got here 
here are the objects in this page. So there are a lot of objects. There are buttons, matrix, slices, I'm not going to go through each every single one, but the core uh, background um, that the game is being played in is a, is a, is a matrix. Um, we have a bunch of um, bookmarks here too. So if I click on a square, has some alignment issues which do come right. Um, click on a square, cool. Okay, so what we can do is we can either click on a button or on the flag on the button to say that we think that this is a mine. Now, all of the logic for this is in a measure called super measure. I'm not very good at naming these things. <clears throat> now, when you think calculated measures, in DAX, all a calculated measure is, is like a function in another language. Now, this function is being called by every single data point on a visual. So in the case of a matrix, when I have a nine by nine matrix, this function is going to be called 81 times. It's gonna execute 81 times. It's gonna execute in the context of the filter context. So it's gonna know for, top, for the top square that um, when I've clicked on it, it's ex it knows it has to um, populate a value for um, you know, something where it's in column one and row one, and it can use those figures within its calculation to help to decide, am I a blank square, am I a number square, am I a flag square, or am I a bomb? So within the very long calculation here, and, and this is an example where you're much better taking this code and popping it into a, another editor, be it um, SQL Server Management Studio or DAX Studio, which is fantastic, scrolling down here <laughs> and we have a bunch of um, variables that work out what you're doing have I stepped on a, a blank square have I stepped on a mine have I stepped on a number square <clears throat> because what I, one thing I also need to do is um, when you do click on a blank square I need to reveal the numbers that are around the edge of that as well I'll, I'll show you what I mean by resetting Come back, we'll just place on a blank square. Here, yeah, cool. Um, I'm using SVG images here. So within the super measure, I am drawing out a, a an SVG number and coloring it, or I'm using a an icon here. The icon is unpressed. These icons are pressed. Um, I'm gonna step on a mine here to show you what happens when you lose. Oh, I need to control click here and bang. So it's telling us that um, we've lost the game. <clears throat> so the the area in this game I would draw my attention to is this super measure. And coming down to the bottom, there's some quite neat logic in here, again, that works with, it, it creates calculated tables in the fly that are relevant for each square. And the square might create a table, which um, are the coordinates and, and details for just the um, surrounding eight squares, whereas something down here will um, do something different. There is a, a little bit of an alignment issue that seems to go away and come right as you go through and play the game. Um, I might have to talk to Will Thompson as to why that might be happening, but um, otherwise, I think it looks fantastic. And I think I have a, a, a play to web version uh, set up here. Um, if I reset that, might be a slightly different game. Uh, let's just keep playing. Oops, set a flag. So there's the alignment issue that you can see, but it's come right and it should be right now. So I can three, one, one, etc. You get the idea. So finally, we've got a couple of minutes left. The last one I want to show you is the, the, the first draft of the next one I'm working on, which I kind of like the idea of a bit of a, a, of a driving game. So this is a bit rough. It is using SVG images, um, and I have to again have to shout out to um, Margarita uh, Prozil, who made a small tweak to the play axis to, to, to get this going. And I've got her working on a different slicer, which is going to um, hopefully enable a, a, a maze exploration game, which will probably be the one after this. But the idea here is that um, I'm a red dot, and I can click on left and right arrows to avoid <laughs> the uh, the oncoming boundaries I guess 
Um, so it's a, it's a very early version, and I'm going to replace these these red and blue dot squares with uh, SVG images, like perhaps a car, and the blue dots might be um, uh, walls and, and grass, etc. Or I might make it a skier and going down some snow, put some trees in there that you'll have to move left and right to um, avoid. Uh, the way this works is, again, I have a, a, a what better move to move, get rid of that. I have a, um, a slicer with a, a table, sorry, with a thousand values. And the play axis is just stepping through uh, value one, value two, value three. Uh, and then I pre-calculate some left and right walls that I draw on on the fly. It kind of knows what's going on. Um, I have about 15 arrows that are sitting on top of each other. Half of them are left, half of them are right. And it only displays one at a time. So when you click on an arrow, it disappears and it knows to bring the next button up, which will control a bookmark, which you'll see over here on the right, I have a slicer. I'm in position three. So I want to move to position four. You just hit the appropriate arrow when you come back to position four. So it's so kind of cool. There's a little bit of scope here to um, make this uh, a little more interesting. So we're nearly at the top of the hour. Hopefully you found this interesting and informative. <laughs> you know, um, it, al it already looks as good as Spy Hunter. I don't know if you've played Spy Hunter as a kid or not, or whatever the case is, but you have to look it up. I give the link in the YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I when I first started playing with Dax, all I thought it could do was, you know, sum some columns, average a column. It would give me a headache if I wanted to do something slightly more sophisticated. I really had no idea what was possible in Dax. Hopefully with today's session, if you don't download the files, if you don't look at the code, that I've at least maybe reset your boundaries or understanding of what is possible in DAX and hopefully it's a lot more than what you thought so when you're thinking about maybe um, you know doing some work on some non-games you know <laughs> that hey DAX can probably do an awful lot more than uh, what you previously had thought certainly it, it can do a lot more than uh, what I, I I previously thought so so Chuck what, any any questions for me how, how are we going there on the chat window you know Seth and Mike and uh, AJ have been actually answering them in situ so uh, there's lots and lots of shout outs for uh, what an amazing job you've done and, and watching you go through is is, is truly watching a, a skilled craftsman at their trade so uh, I want to thank you for this otherwise I'm gonna hand it back to you to finish off okay um, no well thanks for coming everyone yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Um, I will be delivering some more of these at presentations and uh, conferences through the year, but I'll hopefully have added um, some more interesting ones and uh, it'll be different next time you come. Um, download these. There's a lot more in, in DAX inside them and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, email me if you have any questions. Reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to help with answers and suggestions. And if you've got an idea, let me know too. I'd love to hear your ideas about um, maybe a, a deck space game. Um, it doesn't take too long. <laughs> but Tully wants you to do a VR simulation in DAX. Anyway. VR. <laughs> I'll, I'll right, give that guys. one to David. Yeah, we'll give that to David. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Have a great day.